Early September 1944. After the Normandy front broke up in August, the Allies reached the German border. This is defended by the Siegfried Line, which although it was dismantled to reinforce the Atlantic Wall, is being re-equipped at full speed. The British intend to penetrate Germany from the north, with their market garden operation, and the Americans intend to do so through the center and on the southern flank. Both believe that Germany is about to surrender, and hope to be home by Christmas that year, 1944. However, they will soon see that they have greatly underestimated their enemy, and they are practically paralyzed for months, having to fight grueling battles in which they suffer very high casualties. One of those fierce battles is going to be the one that takes place in Aachen, this being also the first German city that was attacked by the Allied land armies. Fighting around the city of Aachen began during mid-September, in a period known to the Germans as the First Battle of Aachen. The city had very little military value, and was simply seen as another city in the advance towards the interior of Germany. In it there was practically no war industry, nor had it been massively bombed like other German cities. The only thing that can be highlighted is its symbolic value, since it had been the capital of Charlemagne, and his Holy Roman Empire, considered the First Reich. In addition to this, it also had the symbolism of being the first German city to be captured by the Allies. At the time, as the American troops were approaching, the city was defended by the 116th Panzer Division, under the command of General von Schwerin. This division consisted of about 1,600 men, 12 usable tanks, and was deprived of artillery guns. It also had other dispersed units and members of the Volkstrom, which raised the number of defenders to about 12,000 men, their combat value being very small. Thus, the German general came to the conclusion that his troops did not have enough strength to defend the city effectively, so that its defense would be a useless loss of life, and would endanger the lives of civilians who had not been evacuated. On the other hand, he also wanted to protect the city's historic architecture and relics from its destruction. With most government officials fled, General Schwerin prepared to surrender the city and declare it an open city, similar to what General von Koltitz had done a few weeks earlier in Paris. To do this, the German general wrote a letter to the American commander notifying him of this decision and asking him to treat the rest of the civilian population with humanity, leaving this letter at the city post office. However, as he was preparing to leave the city, Schwerin received a report from German intelligence that the American advance appeared to have halted to regroup, and therefore the full-scale attack on Aachen was not imminent. In addition, they informed him that reinforcements were being sent to the city in order to defend it properly. Finally, he was ordered to preempt the U.S. attack, and to launch a disabling offensive on U.S. troops massing on the outskirts of the city. This new information and orders made Schwerin completely change his intentions and he prepared to fight. However, it was already too late for him, because the letter that he had left at the post office, and which was never delivered to the Americans, fell into the hands of the German police and was sent to Hitler. Immediately afterwards, the German leader ordered his dismissal and immediate arrest. A little later, Marshals Walter Model and Rundstedt intervened and after being released from his arrest, he was sent to a new position on the Italian front. His replacement commander for the defense of Aachen was Colonel Gerhard Wilk, who at the time was the commander of the 246th Volksgrenadier Division. Hitler, meanwhile, was rushing over as many units as he could from the Eastern Front to reinforce the Aachen Gap, and Field Marshal Rundstedt was recalled to duty to stiffen the crumbling defenses in the West after the Front's breakout at Normandy. Meanwhile, during the days of September 12 to 16, General Collins's 1st American Infantry Division advanced on Aachen, and reconnoitered its defenses. His assessment was that the German defensive line was very weak, and that many of the German bunkers and pillboxes lacked German soldiers to defend them. The only thing that the few and depleted German forces in the area could do was several counterattacks in order to buy time and receive the reinforcements that had been promised. This caused a crescent-shaped arc to form around the city, until the U.S. advance was finally halted on September 22. It should be noted that his arrest was due to the fact that they ran out of ammunition, without gasoline, and without the coverage of their aviation due to bad weather, and not due to the actions of the depleted German troops. 
This shortage was due to the fact that Operation Market Garden had taken priority in terms of the supply of resources and the difficulty that the Allies found in transporting so much supplies from the beaches of Normandy to the German border in such a short time. This week of lull in the fighting was used by the Germans to improve their defenses and to prepare for the fight for the city. Thus, by early October, the Germans had some 24,000 soldiers and a dozen tanks to defend the city. The Americans for their part had three infantry divisions and two armored divisions, totaling some 70,000 men and 200 battle tanks. The American plan was to launch a pincer attack on the city, which, taking advantage of the salient in which it was located, could be easily isolated. The 30th Infantry Division and the 2nd Armored Division would attack from the north, and the 1st and 9th Infantry Divisions along with the 3rd Armored Division would attack from the south. On September 26, the Allies began to bombard the German positions, using their artillery and aviation. This artillery attack lasted for six days, and reminded veteran officers of the heavy bombing raids of World War I. However, despite the tens of thousands of shells fired, the German defensive lines were not particularly damaged. The first division to attack on October 2 was the 30th Infantry Division on the northern flank of Aachen. Together with the 2nd Armored Division, they had to cover several kilometers to the south and cross numerous rivers and German defensive lines. The German defense they encountered was quite weak and they were able to take position after position without suffering too many casualties. The Germans for their part counterattacked near the town of Jubeck, as they thought the Allied offensive was aimed at making a much wider sacking, as they had been led to believe by the Americans who attacked further northeast than necessary. This German attack slowed the advance of the Americans, and it was then that they changed direction and reoriented to the southwest. The Americans did not take long to continue their attack, forcing the Germans to concentrate all the reserves they had, which were sent towards Alsdorf, to desperately stop the Allied offensive. While fighting was taking place in the city of Alsdorf, the Americans attacked the south wing of Aachen on October 8. This attack by the 1st Infantry Division was preceded by a massive artillery attack that completely devastated the German defenses, which greatly helped a rapid advance. After heavy fighting, two days later the American troops were able to occupy high positions in the northeast of Aachen, and reach the point where they had to connect with the units of the Northern Pincer, which had not yet arrived. In any event, on October 10, the Americans delivered an ultimatum to the German forces in Aachen, threatening to bombard the city into submission if the garrison did not surrender. The German commander refused to hand over the city to them, and by October 11 the Americans began the bombardment. In all, some 5,000 artillery shells, and some 100 tons of bombs by aviation, were fired and dropped on the city, turning Aachen into a city in ruins. At this time, fighting was taking place all along the front line, and it is difficult to focus on all of them, but the most important for this date of October 13th and 14th was the American penetration of the Northern Pincer, and the German counterattacks to prevent to close the siege on Aachen. On the 16th, Aachen was surrounded, and the Germans inside the city prepared for the final defense. 5,000 German fighters, including converted personnel from the Navy, Air Force, and city police, garrisoned Aachen at the time. For the most part, these soldiers were inexperienced and untrained, and were only supported by a handful of tanks and assault guns. The only advantage they had was that they knew the streets of the city well, and could move through all its tunnels and cellars. Thus, the ground attack on the city from the south began on October 13 by one of the regiments of the U.S. 1st Infantry Division, which was continually ambushed by the defenders. This advance was very slow, since they had to fight for every house in the city. In a similar fashion to what would later occur in Berlin, the Americans made their way through the city firing point blanket buildings with their largest caliber howitzers. These created passageways that allowed foot soldiers to advance from building to building without having to enter the city streets, where they could be pinned down by enemy fire. While these battles were taking place inside the city, the Germans were sending counterattacks with the aim of breaking the encirclement and reinforcing the defenses of Aachen, but all of them were repulsed. By October 18, Rundstedt assumed that it would be impossible to save the city, and ceased efforts to liberate it. 
The next day, the commander of the city's defense, Colonel Wilk issued the following statement. The defenders of Aachen will prepare for their last stand. Confined to the smallest space possible, we will fight to the last man, to the last shell and to the last bullet, in accordance with the Führer's orders. Faced with the despicable treason committed by certain individuals, I hope that each and every one of the defenders of the venerable imperial city of Aachen will do their duty to the end, in fulfillment of our Pledge of Allegiance. I hope for courage and determination to resist. At that time, the space occupied by the Germans in the city was very small, and Colonel Wilk and the rest of the commanders had their headquarters in a heavily fortified air raid shelter in the city. Other German units held out at the famous Quellenhof Hotel. The last fighting in the city took place there, right in the center of it, where the Americans fired with all the artillery they had. Finally, at noon on October 21st, Colonel Wilk surrendered, and the city fell into American hands. The balance of casualties of this battle was about 7,000 for the Americans, and about 11,000 for the Germans, 5,600 of them being prisoners. The American units that suffered the most were those in the northern pincer, since it was there that the Germans defended themselves and counterattacked with more intensity. In any case, the casualties of all the combats that took place in the vicinity of Aachen are much higher, making it very difficult to quantify them all. The battle that followed this, and which also took place a few kilometers away, were the numerous clashes in the Hurtgen Forest, in which the Americans exceeded 50,000 casualties, this being one of their bloodiest battles. We find ourselves in Hurtgen Forest during mid-September 1944. While Montgomery was launching one of his most ambitious operations in Holland known as Market Garden, the Americans launched one of the fiercest and bloodiest battles on the Western Front further south. This battle would last for a total of four months, and would cause some 50,000 casualties in the U.S. Army. This caused the battle to become known to the Americans as the Meat Grinder, in a similar way to what had happened on the Eastern Front in the Rezef Salient. Despite being as late as September 1944, in which Germany had just suffered heavy defeats on all fronts, the German army was still a very powerful fighting machine, and they were masters of both defense and attack. In addition, at this time they were already fighting on German soil, which gave him extra motivation. The American captain William Depew, who would become a general years later, was present in these combats and this was the opinion that years later he issued. When it came to defending, the Germans took portions of land to convert them into positions from the ones who could shoot in any direction. They knew how to cover and conceal themselves, as well as how to use their imaginations. A handful of Germans could take on a whole regiment just by embedding their weapons in the most suitable way. As for the attacks, the Germans mastered the art of putting out fires through the use of machine guns. The more they fired, the less ours did, and the more dangerous everything became until our men finally stopped firing. Then we knew that the Germans were going to destroy our ranks, capture some soldiers or finish them off and completely defeat us. When the German front in Normandy finally collapsed in mid-August, the Allies became very excited and saw that the end of the war was near. Believing that their enemy was already defeated, and that the war would end before Christmas, the Allied commanders made a series of mistakes that would pay dearly. The Siegfried Line, which had been dismantled for the most part to build the Atlantic Wall, and the Rhine River, were going to be the last obstacles to enter Germany, but they soon saw that this advance was going to be much more difficult than they thought. The first German city to be attacked by the US Army was the city of Aachen, in which the German soldiers resisted forcefully for 20 days. At the same time that the battle for the city was taking place, the Americans continued to push further south, plunging deeper into the Hurtgen Forest. His intention was to penetrate the Siegfried Line as soon as possible, to then cross the Rhine River, and capture the Ruhr Basin as soon as possible, thereby completely sinking German industrial production. While Montgomery was trying to do this from the north, U.S. General Hodges was going to do it from the south. Another objective that the Americans had to advance quickly through this sector was to prevent the Germans from breaking a series of dams that would cause the entire area to be flooded. The Germans were amazed when they saw that their enemy plunged into this forest, knowing that it was a perfect area for defense where they could cause tens of thousands of casualties to the Americans. 
Walter Model was at that time the commander of Army Group B that protected that sector. There the German Marshal had established special defenses that would make the most of the characteristics of the terrain. Although the Americans initially had a 5 to 1 superiority, the veteran German soldiers held their own against Allied units, most of whom had just arrived as replacements. The Allied unit in charge of advancing through the region was the U.S. 1st Army, leaving its 5th and 7th Corps within the Hurtgen Forest. In total, some 14 infantry, armored and airborne divisions would fight in this battle that went on for months. The German force that initially defended the forest were two German divisions totaling about 10,000 troops, although as the weeks went by, other units arrived to reinforce the position. The first confrontation took place on September 19 when a U.S. infantry regiment entered the forest and was repulsed by the defenders. After this initial trial, two weeks later the rest of the U.S. 9th Infantry Division attacked the area in the direction of the city of Schmidt. After advancing only about 3 kilometers during 11 days of intense combat in which the unit suffered 4,500 casualties, the division had to be replaced, as it had been completely torn to pieces. One of the reasons why they had suffered so many casualties was because inside the forest they could hardly use tanks and the infantry had to advance without any type of protection. The next American attack would be carried out by its 28th Infantry Division, which had precisely replaced the 9th, beginning on November 2nd. The difference between this attack and the previous ones was that the Germans were fully prepared, having had plenty of time to reinforce the position. This time the Americans attacked from a broad front that practically extended through the entire forest. Although they were able to advance a few meters, these were at a very high cost and the offensive was quickly stopped. The Germans then counterattacked with all types of units including armor and recovered most of the lost territory, causing the American withdrawal. It was on November 8 when the Germans recaptured the town of Schmidt that this first phase of the battle ended, and it did so with a German defensive victory. The second phase of this fighting began a few days later, as part of a general offensive launched by the Americans to advance towards the Ruhr River, known as Operation Reina. The fighting took place from November 18 and lasted until December 16, this being the date on which the Battle of the Bulge began some 30 kilometers further south. This was the toughest phase of the battle in which, colloquially, the Americans put all the meat on the grill. Little by little they made their way at a very high cost in casualties, until on November 28 they managed to conquer the city of Hurtgen, which was located to the southeast of the forest. During the first days of December the American troops tried to continue advancing and were able to take new villages and hills from the forest, but their pace was so slow that they did not pose a serious danger to the Germans. Shortly before the fighting stopped due to the focus shifting to the Ardennes, the Germans were able to counterattack and take the important Hill 400, which they had lost days earlier. With this, they revalidated their defensive positions and the battle stalled until again in February 1945, the Allies resumed their advance. They finally forced their way through what remained of Hurtgen Forest in a week from February 10 to 17, meeting weak German resistance. The final count of casualties throws up a dramatic figure for the Americans, as it is estimated that they suffered a total of 55,000 casualties either directly or indirectly. To give us an idea of the magnitude of this series of battles, these 55,000 casualties are somewhat less than half of what the Americans suffered during the almost three months that the Battle of Normandy lasted. The Germans for their part suffered some 28,000 casualties, in which we also have to include an undetermined number of soldiers who were taken prisoner. Finally let's see the opinion of Professor Michael Howard, who after his fight against the Wehrmacht became a military historian. A few years after the end of the conflict he said the following. Until the war had reached a very advanced stage, those in charge of the British and American ground forces were well aware that if they were to meet German troops on anything approaching a level playing field, there was a good chance that his own troops suffered a resounding defeat. They were better than us, we can never stress this too much. Every Allied soldier who faced them knew this, and did not consider it humiliating. We were no more than amateurs, taken from peaceful industrial societies endowed with obvious cultural prejudices towards everything military, fighting against the best professionals of the moment. We made our way through Europe with as little finesse as possible and as many high explosives as possible. 
We have to point out that Professor Howard received a lot of criticism and personal attacks for these words of his, from former veteran soldiers who had another view in which they felt far superior to the Germans. However, he also received many letters from officers who had fought on the most critical points of the front and who supported his opinion. After having recently analyzed battles such as Hurtgen, Aachen, and Ardennes, today it is the turn of the little-known Operation Northwind, which is considered the last major German offensive on the Western Front. There is no doubt that this offensive, which began on December 31, 1944, was eclipsed by the offensive in the Ardennes and because of this has gone largely unnoticed, and rarely mentioned. However, and as we have just indicated, in this battle that lasted for a month, Germany launched the Attack 6 Army Corps, in a desperate attempt to stop the Allied advance, and retake the operational initiative. It all started when, on December 16, Hitler gave the order to start the Ardennes Offensive, with which he intended to penetrate the American defenses in that sector, and advance to the city of Antwerp. With this he would take the important port that was in the city, and would isolate the British armies that were north of said position. With this he hoped to achieve a few months of total tranquility on the Western Front, or even force the British and Americans to sign a separate peace. However, within days of the German attack beginning, American resistance proved to be much stronger than anticipated, and along with other German failures and errors, it became clear that it was going to be impossible to meet the objectives of the operation. Thus, and faced with this stalemate in the Ardennes, to which the Allies had assigned many reinforcements to control the situation, the German high command gave the green light to a new offensive some 200 kilometers further south, with various objectives. First, the main objective was to deal another heavy blow to the Allies, attacking in an area that had recently been weakened, as part of Patton's Third Army had just been sent north to support the defense of the Ardennes. Second, this would relieve the pressure that the Allies were putting on the German salient formed in the Ardennes, so perhaps it would be possible for the German attack in that sector to continue. It should be noted that this offensive had already been considered during the middle of November, although it had finally been cancelled because it was decided to bet everything on the Ardennes. However, it was as a result of the evolution of this offensive in the Ardennes that this operation in Alsace was resumed. The German plan, which Marshal Rundstedt and other Western Front generals devised, called for a pincer attack that would cut off the salient in northern Alsace that the Allies had conquered. The German objective was to reach the city of Zabern, and from there to see what else they could do, with the recapture of Strasbourg being very present. The German armies that participated in the operation were those belonging to Army Group G, these being the first German army that would be in charge of the northern pincer, and the 19th Army that would attack from the east. In total there were some 500,000 troops on that date, although it is not possible to specify exactly how many of them ended up participating in the operation. In addition, when these figures are given, it must be taken into account that of this total number of troops, only approximately one-third are combat soldiers, since the rest have other administrative and logistical tasks that allow frontline soldiers to fight. On paper, both armies had many divisions, most of them being Volksgrenadier divisions. The reality, however, was that many of them had the strength of a regiment, and there were hardly any tanks to support the offensive, since almost all of them had concentrated in the Ardennes. A couple of days before the offensive, Hitler met with the main German generals who were going to participate in this operation, and told them the following in his particular speech. I fully agree with the measures that have been taken. I hope we can push the right wing in particular to open the entrances to Zabern, and then immediately push into the Rhine Plain and liquidate the American divisions. Destroying these American divisions must be the goal. The mere idea of this offensive taking place will have a happy effect on the German people. And if this offensive continues, and the first really great successes appear, you can be sure that the German people will make all the sacrifices that are humanly possible. Therefore. I would like all of us to support this operation with all our energy and drive. This is one of the crucial operations. Its success will absolutely automatically imply the success of the current offensive in the Ardennes. So if we succeed here, we will dominate fate after all. Once we have seen the situation and the German plans, let's see what the Allied situation was and what forces it had in the sector. 
As we have said before, this sector had been weakened due to the reinforcements that had to be sent to contain the German offensive in the Ardennes. Thus, Eisenhower himself considered that this territory that they had conquered in Alsace was unimportant, and he was studying the possibility of abandoning part of it, with the aim of retreating to better defensible positions and sending his troops to other more important sectors. The Tsarland sector was considered to be much more important either for advancing or for receiving a German attack, so just before the Germans began their Northwind operation, the Americans were considering moving back to the Vosges. In any case, this is not why the Allied forces in this area were weak, since it is estimated that between the 7th American Army and the French 1st Army they had about 700,000 troops. Once again, and just like on the German side, not all of them participated in these combats, nor were all of them frontline soldiers. And well once we have entered the situation, let's go to the development of the battle. The German attack began on the afternoon of December 31st without any previous artillery attack, completely surprising the American defenders. A first German attack group managed to break through the front around Bleisbrock and in a couple of days penetrated 10 kilometers to the south in the direction of the French town of Aiken. A second assault group attacked about 25 kilometers further to the southeast and achieved a further penetration, reaching the city of Wingen by the first days of January. Despite the fact that the Germans had not obtained great successes during these first days, the reaction of the American General Devers, who was the commander of that sector, was to start the planned withdrawal and not put up a tough resistance to the Germans. This made de Gaulle very angry, who did not want French territory to be ceded again, and he did everything possible so that Eisenhower did not authorize said withdrawal, which he finally achieved. Thus, in view of their poor progress and the depth of the American defenses at both Aiken and Wingen, the Germans decided to attack further east, and the offensive was now directed in the direction of Haguenau. To do this, they attacked from the north and also from the east, for which the Germans had to cross the Rhine and establish a bridgehead. This attack had much more momentum than the previous ones and the Germans were able to advance little by little about 30 kilometers until they reached the Motor River, after having taken the city of Haguenau. In an attempt to stop this German advance, the Americans had to send reinforcements to the area, with the aim of carrying out a counterattack. This Allied mission was led by the 12th Armored Division, which was repulsed by German anti-tank guns at Herlesheim on 8-10 January. At the same time a little further south, the Germans attacked in the direction of Strasbourg. This sector was defended by French soldiers, who at first suffered a defeat and fell back a few kilometers. However, a few days later they managed to regroup and managed to stop the German advance dead about 20 kilometers south of Strasbourg on January 13. From this point the combats were very intense, and they were taking place along a front line of about 100 kilometers in length. The main German attack was taking place north of Strasbourg, in a German attempt to cross the Motor River and continue south. On this date, which runs from January 16 to 21, the Germans had also been able to bring reinforcements to the area, in which panzer units stand out, such as the 10th Division of the Waffen-SS. Despite the fact that this division wreaked havoc around Herlesheim, defeating three American battalions and taking down numerous armored vehicles, it was not enough to break through the Allied defenses, and by January 21 the German offensive stalled. Next, the Germans tried a series of breaks in the direction of Zabern, failing to make any new advance on the Allied lines, which had already been sufficiently reinforced, and which were in better defensive positions. This lack of momentum was also due to the fact that the reinforcements and supplies that the Germans could send to this region of Alsace were completely reduced, due to the fact that all their attention had to be placed on the Eastern Front, in which the Soviets were they were approaching Berlin. Thus, far from being able to send any units, the three most powerful divisions that had participated in this offensive were sent to the Vistula Army Group during the days of January 27 and early February. In any case, and as we have indicated before, by January 25, 1945, the offensive of Army Group B was completely paralyzed north of Alsace due to the weakening of the German army, which had exhausted all its reserves of supplies, ammunition, and gasoline which had been assigned for the operation. As a consequence of such inconveniences, 
The Germans opted to keep the ground they had gained and to definitively cancel Operation Northwind, while they reinforced the Oder Front. In this operation, the German army suffered approximately 23,000 casualties between dead, wounded, missing and prisoners. The Allies for their part suffered 14,000 casualties, being 12,000 soldiers from the American army and 2,000 from the French army. After having finished Operation Northwind, the German army had reconquered about 40 kilometers of territory inside Alsace. However, this conquest did not have any kind of importance, since the Germans failed to meet any of their planned objectives. This was due to the fact that they were not able to wear down the Allies, nor conquer Strasbourg nor favor the development of the offensive in the Ardennes. Thus, they wore out more than the Americans and had more losses than them, and as always happened to them, they were losses that they could hardly bear. March 7, 1945 The Americans still don't believe it, but they have managed to capture the Remagen Bridge virtually intact. The Rhine Riverbank, which the Germans had hoped to hold out on for months, is now in danger of collapsing completely if they fail to destroy the bridge and prevent the Allies from beginning to cross it at full speed. But how was this possible? How did operations develop in the vicinity of Remagen? And finally, what consequences did this great German mistake have? Well, that is exactly what we are going to see next. To do this, let's go back to September 1944. The Allies had broken through France after breaking through the German defenses in Normandy in August of that same year. Due to the rapid advance of the last month, they thought that the German armies were already defeated, and that at this rate they would reach Berlin before the new year. To break the new front line, they launched the ambitious Market Garden operation in Dutch territory, with which they hoped to penetrate the northern border of Germany, to later head towards the Ruhr Basin. However, and despite the large deployment of troops that were mobilized for this operation, this Montgomery offensive was stopped by the German Marshal Walter model. A few days later and practically simultaneously, the Americans launched another offensive with which they intended to enter Germany through Aachen. This led to a series of very intense combats both in Aachen and in the Hürtgen Forest, in which the Allied advance was so slow that it did not pose any problem. Subsequently, the Germans launched their offensive in the Ardennes on December 16, and by the end of that month, they also launched another major attack in Alsace that was known as Operation Northwind, which we also recently saw in the channel. These attacks were a major setback for the Allies, who ended up stopping the advances they had been making on the German border to date. Thus, they could not resume their advance towards the heart of Germany until the end of February 1945. It was in the last week of February and the first two weeks of March, when the Allies advanced between 50 and 100 kilometers along the entire front line, and managed to reach the banks of the Rhine River. As we said at the beginning, the Germans expected to hold out in this natural defense for months, although due to what happened in Remagen, their entire defensive approach completely collapsed. After the Normandy landings, the Germans sent explosives to all of their bridges on the new Western Front, so that they would be ready to be blown up when needed. No one knew if the invasion would be overwhelmingly successful, or if it would be repulsed, but it was better to be prepared. In any case, and as is evident, the explosives could not be placed on the bridge immediately, as they could explode by mistake. Let us also remember that these bridges played an important role for Germany, which needed to send reinforcements to the Normandy front, so their destruction was then a priority objective for the Allies. Thus, the Remagen Bridge was bombarded by Allied aviation repeatedly, receiving several direct hits. However, after brief repairs it was put into operation again and again. By early March, the American plan was as follows. The first army was to attack the Rhine and between Dusseldorf and Cologne, and capture the Ruhr Basin from the south. On the other hand, Patton's third army had to cross the Rhine in the Koblenz sector. Once this defensive line was overcome, the Allies would break through Germany unstoppably. At this point we have to indicate that the Allies did not expect to capture any bridge intact, since they were sure that the Germans would blow it up long before their arrival. Thus, they began a series of attacks with the aim of destroying them in order to capture the largest number of Germans who had not yet crossed. 
This is the reason why the explosive charges could not be placed until the bridge had to be destroyed, because in one of these air raids it could explode prematurely. The Germans, for their part, were interested in having the bridge operational for as long as possible, so that the greatest number of troops, as well as the civilian population, could take refuge inside Germany. By the beginning of that month of March, the installation of boxes and cables were already installed on the bridge, with only the explosives to be placed inside them. The order was not to place the explosives until the Allies were about 8 kilometers from the bridge. At that time they would be placed at full speed, and the bridge would be demolished. The engineer captain in charge of demolition of the bridge was called Karl Frenzehan, and he had about 120 troops to carry out his task. Because the explosive charges sent months ago had ended up being used in other missions, at the beginning of March Karl had requested 600 kilos of industrial explosive, but that March 7th at 11 in the morning he only received 300 kilos of an explosive of less power than was used in mining. Whether or not it was enough, the Germans had no choice but to plant these explosive charges and pray that the Remagen bridge could be destroyed with them. Two hours later, around 1 p.m. on March 7th, a small vanguard of the 7th Armored Division, belonging to General Hodge's 1st U.S. Army, arrived in the vicinity of the bridge. The young lieutenant who led this small vanguard force, this being the German-born Lieutenant Timmerman, was completely surprised when he saw that the bridge was still intact, and after informing his superiors, he received orders to attack immediately and capture the bridge. At this precise moment, the Germans were finishing placing the explosives, the task of which they did not complete until 2.30 p.m. under enemy fire. So as soon as they had finished and withdrew to the eastern part of the bridge, the Germans activated the first charge, which opened a large hole at the western entrance to the bridge, thus preventing any American vehicles from crossing it. However, this was not to stop the infantry. Thus, the German Captain Frenzenhan did not stop requesting permission over and over again to activate the rest of the charges and definitively demolish the bridge. This order finally came from his direct superior Scheller, who was the commander of the Remagen defense, at 3.20 p.m. So at full speed, Capital Karl tried to activate the explosive charges but this time they didn't work. The only way to activate the charge was to activate the secondary circuit, for which someone had to go almost halfway across the bridge, which the Americans were already advancing on. The German Corporal Aston Fazit volunteered for this task. Finally the explosive charge was able to activate, but only the one on the eastern side did, and because the explosive was not suitable either, it was not enough to bring down the bridge. The Americans, for their part, did not know what was happening, and expected that the rest of the cargo would end up exploding at any moment and the bridge would end up sinking, however, that never happened. Despite this risk, Timmerman made his men advance and they began to receive shots from the Germans from the other side of the bridge. As they advanced, they cut the keys and removed any boxes that might contain explosives. In an attempt to stop the American advance, Captain Karl Frentehan tried to recruit all the men he could who were sheltering in the tunnel near Remagen, but the few soldiers he had were not enough to stop the Americans. At the same time, Commander Scheller took a bicycle and escaped from there, to go as quickly as possible to some other command post and inform the German High Command that the bridge was going to fall into American hands. This was because no radio or telephone was working on the eastern side of the Remagen Bridge. Finally, Lieutenant Timmerman was able to finish crossing the river around 5 p.m. and the German garrison surrendered. Before analyzing the consequences of the capture of this bridge, let us try to resolve the question of how this huge mistake in blowing up the bridge was possible. This investigation was carried out by the Americans, who interrogated the soldiers they had captured on the bridge. Lieutenant Frenzahan affirmed that the most likely thing is that the main cable had been hit by a high-caliber projectile and had been cut. Some Polish workers claimed that they were the ones who sabotaged the cables, however this is false because the circuit was fine when they tested it before the demolition. In any case, it is likely that someone committed sabotage at the last moment. Finally, it is also possible that some inexperienced engineer made a mistake. The conclusion they drew was that it was not possible to know for sure what had happened, 
since all the cables had been cut by the Americans themselves while they had advanced across the bridge. Next, let's see what measures the Germans had to take in this situation. The truth is that the German reaction was very slow and somewhat chaotic, due to the confusion of the moment. So they didn't find out until many hours later what had happened in Remagen. The next day when Walter Model found out, he ordered a counterattack to destroy as much of the bridge as possible. Some 100 engineers were assembled for this mission, which from barges would approach the bridge and destroy it. However, the Allies had set up strong defenses and immediately captured them. A day later, Model assigned General Bayerlein the mission to counterattack at Remagen and drive off the Americans who had already crossed back to the other side of the Rhine. For this task, he was given command of numerous panzer divisions that were in the area, but were badly depleted and scattered, as well as short of fuel and ammunition. Bayerlein could not do anything other than regroup, but this required several days that were not granted. So, he was ordered to attack immediately with what little he had. At the same time, the Remagen Bridge had also been ordered to be attacked by the Luftwaffe in order to destroy it. So for several days, the Luftwaffe was attacking the bridge over and over again, losing about 110 planes in that mission without the bridge sinking. Goebbels declared that it was a real catastrophe that the Remagen Bridge had been taken by the Americans, and that they had established a bridgehead on the Rhine. He commented that this was something that deeply tormented the German leader and that caused him a lot of anxiety. Between March 7th and 14th, some 11 badly weakened divisions attacked the American bridgehead but were unable to reduce it, and the Americans continued to gradually expand it. From this point on, the Germans used everything to destroy this bridge, among which we can highlight a total of 12 V-2 rockets that were launched against the Remagen Bridge, frogmen that were sent down the river, and all kinds of artillery and aviation attacks. As a curious fact, the V-2 that fell closest to the bridge did so at about 270 meters away, although it did not manage to damage it. Finally, during the early hours of March 17th, the Remagen Bridge ended up sinking on its own due to all the damage it had been accumulating, killing 28 engineers who were working on its repair and injuring 68. In any case, this collapse did not have a significant importance due to the following. When the bridge collapsed 10 days after it was captured, more than 25,000 Allied soldiers had crossed the bridge, and three more bridges had already been built in the vicinity of Remagen. By then, the Remagen bridgehead was 13 kilometers deep and 40 kilometers wide. In all this strip they were carrying out construction works of new bridges without the Germans being able to offer resistance. Thus this seizure of the bridge created a sudden additional burden on the German defenses and multiplied their confusion. They had been expecting a large build-up along the Rhine before crossing the river, and the advance at Remagen meant that the beleaguered German forces lost a much-needed opportunity to regroup east of the Rhine. Eisenhower described the capture of the bridge as, one of those rare and fleeting opportunities that occasionally arise in war, and which, if seized, have incalculable effects in determining future success. Later, he commented, We were across the Rhine, on a permanent bridge, the traditional defensive barrier to the heart of Germany was breached. The final defeat of the enemy, which he had long calculated to be achieved in the spring campaign and summer of 1945, suddenly now, in our minds, it was just around the corner. On the other hand, General George Marshall commented, the bridgehead represented a serious threat to the heart of Germany, an invaluable distraction. It became a springboard for the final offensive that was coming. Finally, other generals declared that the capture of the Remagen Bridge shortened the war on the Western Front between two and six months, and saved the Americans some 35,000 deaths. What is clear is that the German defenses collapsed completely on the entire Western Front at the end of March, and added to the Soviet offensives in March and April, they led to the final collapse of the Third Reich. Finally we have to indicate that five German officers were sentenced to death for this big mistake, including Commander Scheller, who was executed. Well, I hope that this program on this iconic bridge of the Second World War has been interesting for you. If you are interested in other battles prior to these, such as those of Aachen, Hürtgen, Ardennes, or Northwind, I will leave them in the description. Thank you all for being part of this community, 
and especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and we'll see each other here as always, next Thursday and Sunday. See you soon.